Three and again. Jake, before we get started, I had a quick question. Does sure. Israel have a Navy? Yes. Thank you. Um, it's not, it's, you know, it's interesting. The Navy has grown in the IDF because of terrorism and because of, of the massive amount of weapons and stuff that's smuggled into Gaza. Um, this is a, it's interesting. Uh, I am a subscriber to a really great newsletter you can get for free. It's, the, it's called the Early Bird Update from Defense News. And Defense News is the name of the umbrella organization that prints a lot of individual defense uh, magazines and, and weeklies. And it also includes some of the independent news media. And the, the thing that ha is really, really popular in defense spending right now and the, 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 the holy grail that everyone's looking for are underwater drones that can work as effectively as airborne drones. This has been a big part of defense technology research. They haven't really built the best one yet. But the Israelis are a big driver of that market because they would really like to have underwater drones that can patrol Gaza like submarines. Um, Israel is one of the biggest users of two and three person submarines. And it, women are more represented in the combat Navy than any other part of the I, IDF. Like you're more like if you if you're looking for women who have real combat level positions in the IDF, they're the higher percent, highest percentage is in the Navy. I'm not sure why that is. I have a cousin who's in the Navy. Yeah. Um, we need to figure out a Hebrew version of in the Navy by the village people. <laughs> sing it on forum. <laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, Jake did a phenomenal job with the War of Independence. We all learned a lot on that, and I'm really glad to have you back um, on a nice rainy night in New York. Um, and I, I notice, uh, what's the t-shirt today? It's, it's uh, I'm generic tonight, I'm, uh, I'm Parv. But I still have my light, this is a really good color for me, so. Um, so yeah, you, you need to have the big red t-shirt next time. Um, mm. So, um, red, red is not a good color for a pale for a pale man like myself. <laughs> hey, um, so um, we're going to do the Suez crisis tonight, um, and um, I really appreciated all your your graphics on your last presentation. I'm excited to see what you got tonight. And so, on that note, um, Jake, why don't you take it away? Thank you. Um, myself. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I did last time that I love to do whenever I um, talk or, or write an editorial is if I can if I can set the stage, it's a really, really good thing to do. And I learned that from my dad. Um, my dad, uh, whenever he comes to visit me, whatever, wherever I happen to be living, and people find out who he is, he invariably is asked to speak at whatever synagogue we are that Shabbat, usually in the afternoon. And one, many years ago, he did that, and they asked him to just to teach like the Pirkei Avot afternoon class on Saturday afternoon. And he spent most of the class, instead of, you know, it was like one small mission that he taught, but he spent most of the class just setting the scene, which I don't think enough people do. Um, setting the scene, like what was the situation in Israel, the land of Israel at the time, you know, definitely called Judea at the time, what, at the time of the, of the mission. You know, who was in charge, who, you know, what were the fight, who were the different elements, what the heck was going on. So from that, I always like to do a scene setter, which I, which I thought was more educational than the actual individual mission at the time. So it's important to set the scene, you know, where, where we last left off, last left off in our last episode last week, the, the Israel has gutted out the war of independence, which really the heavy fighting and the, and this, the actually in many ways, the war of independence was decided quickly. But the fighting doesn't really end until 1949. You can say really the fighting never ends because individual raids against Israeli kibbutzim and what we some some people and, and small villages never really ended. You never really had a year where that didn't happen between 1949 and, and, and where we're going to get to tonight, 1956. But you know the idea of an organized war and campaign and invasion ends in in, in, in 1949. And Israel is, has established itself, and because, you know, thinking of it like a poker game, because 
the Palestinians had thrown in their uh, their chips with the with the invasion, they kind of lost their their partition plan country, which they never wanted anyway. They didn't they, they would rather have nothing than, than to live next to the a Jewish state. And so they got nothing. Uh, this this is, a the, you know, wash, rinse and repeat. This continues to happen up to this day. I and mean, literally, this is where we are now. And that's not to say that Israel can't possibly do more for peace and other people can't do po possibly more for peace. But at the end of the day, we keep coming between this rock and a hard place, which is the Palestinian, at least the Palestinian leadership. And sadly, according to polls that I trust, too many of the Palestinian people would really rather have nothing than to have a Jewish state next to them. So they continue to get nothing, which is really a, huma a humanitarian tragedy more than anything else. But that's just something to remember. Um, so that's where they are now. After 1949, the early 1950s, especially like 1950 through 1953, are incredibly difficult years for the new land of Israel. And when I say that, it's actually not so much about military or terrorism or other kinds of threats, although that stuff was definitely a part of the equation. You had an economic situation in Israel that was really, really close to being completely untenable. It was really, really bad. And then on top of it, you had two years in a row of bad flooding, which really hurt Israel's nascent infrastructure and agricultural uh, communities at the time. It was so bad that uh, my grandfather and his youngest brother, who were the only people in his family to survive the Holocaust, they both left Lithuania in 1923. My grandfather coming to the United States and my great uncle going to what was then Palestine. Uh, and, and they both were very successful in their own ways. But economically, my grandfather, the doctor in Chicago was doing very well. And when my mother was reunited with her cousins just a few years ago, they said, you know, in the early 50s, because of your father, we ate. Otherwise, we didn't eat. So there was a real, real economic, to think about the, when you think about Israel and its pre-State of Israel days, and, you know, if you ever see movies or read books about Golda Meir and her husband's getting malaria and all that, I mean, it was not so much better in the early 50s. It was still really, really threadbare as a country. So that's another thing to remember about where we are specifically in 1952, when Gamal Abdel Nasser, who was a colonel in the Egyptian army, but very, very charismatic and popular in the army, really, but he's not a general, and he's not the head of the army, so he can only be part of a group of people which overthrows the monarchy. Now, last time I spoke about, I spoke about the king of Egypt. His name was not Pharaoh. The king of Egypt at that time was King Farouk. And, and again, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of things tonight where I talk about uh, just a familiar, sad pattern that runs over and over again in the Middle East. And King Farouk, who I talked about last time, was pretty much open to an idea of a Jewish state until 1933 when the Nazis told him to cut it out. Uh, and they did it to Mussolini, too, by the way. Maybe some of you uh, watching tonight might know that about half of Mussolini's government was Jewish until Hitler told him to get rid of them. Um, so it was a similar situation in Egypt under King Farouk until 1933 when, when the Nazis say, you know, get rid of the Jews and stop being kind of a quiet supporter of an idea of a Jewish state, you know, or we're going to cut you off economically, which was important because Germany was a big buyer of Egyptian cotton. So, but King Farouk was, as much as he would have been a better choice than some of the people that came after him as far as his policies towards Israel and the Jews, he was still incredibly corrupt. I think he weighed 500 pounds which at the time was, you know, not as not as sadly common as it is today, <laughs> and uh, that was indicative. His, his his the frame of his body was similar to the to the uh, decay of his his uh, morals, um, and so that, by the way, has it was a huge foot has always been a huge foothold for radical elements within the Muslim world, within the Arab world. Now, usually in our more modern history, in our more recent history, we've seen that as being as a foothold for Islamists for religious Islamists to say, look at these corrupt uh, secular dictators. You really need not only a new leadership, but you need religious leadership. This is a little bit earlier in that process. And so Nasser is not a religious guy. Nasser and his cohorts at the time, because Nasser's really just, a, he's, one of, he's one of many participants right now. He's not quite the leader yet. In 1952, he overthrows Farouk. And they decide to have a more military, a military dis dictatorship in Egypt. And it takes about two years from 1952 to 1954 when Nasser finally either pushes out or wins over the other military folks in his junta. And he becomes the president, you know, the president, which is a funny term. I've always, as a journalist, I've always been angry when we use the official terms of dictators that they like us to use. If they're a dictator, call them a dictator. 
So, for example, you know, I, I don't like calling Ali Khamenei the supreme leader of Iran. He's a dictator. He's a dictator of Iran. Why can't we just say that? You know, I mean, what if he called himself, you know, the grand rabbi or whatever? He's not. You know, he probably isn't really much of an ayatollah either. I'd like to see him pass the chid. You know, if they ever had a Bible, the international Bible contest, but for the Quran, I'd like to see how well he'd do in the Chidon HaKoran. But anyway, that's a, another story. But anyway, um, so he's the leader now, 1954. And initially in Israel, there is, especially between that 52 and 54 period, but even in 1954, initially in Israel, there is optimism that perhaps this will be a positive result. Again, this sounds, for those of you who remember the Arab Spring of 2011 or so, you might remember that there was also that kind of optimism that yes, you know, we had kind of a working relationship with this last guy, but it wasn't good. Hopefully we can get something better. And they really thought that a secular guy like Nasser, a guy who had military experience, who, well, you know, one of the things that some military people have is that they have a little bit of a, of a pragmatic approach sometimes, not always. And they were hoping for the best with him, but very quickly it's clear that he's not, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's not only not a good thing, but a bad thing because he immediately starts the whole idea of invading Israel, not in full force invasions, but with smaller invasions, smaller incursions into Israel. And he not only does that with Egyptian forces, but much more problematically, he starts doing it with, um, he starts doing it with P Palestinians, basically, in Gaza. He uses them um, and they, in a group that's called the Fedayeen. So he really, in many ways, is one of the fathers of the Palestinian terrorist movement. Now, and the other big father of the Palestinian terrorist movement, specifically the PLO, is the KGB. The KGB created the PLO, but it's unfair to say the KGB created Palestinian terrorism because, first of all, we know there were Palestinian terrorist attacks in pre-State of Israel times. Of course, the Hebron massacre is being the most famous incident in 1929. But he starts to create them more in a, in a regular type force. I mean, he gives them a name. He gives them a command structure. So it's super problematic for Israel because this is an enemy within. And what's even worse about it is that Nasser doesn't come along. He's not just a bloodthirsty guy who likes to kill. He's a real full-fledged anti-Semite. He really is into the anti-Semitic anti ideology. He follows it really, really well. And if we use our first um, link right now, there's a really good book about it. It's actually not a book. It's a, it's a paper about it. This is the first link. Um, that I, I, To me, it was one of the first times when someone finally wrote the importance of Nasser. Now, this was this particular article that you see up here is connected more to 1967, but of course the roots of this are are, are right there in 1954 when these raids start. He's an anti-Semite. He's not just someone who wants to get rid of the British and the French. So did King Farouk. He's not just someone who wants to create a uh, a modern Egypt. He is really, really anti-Semitic. And again, this has very similar mirror. Um, elements to the Arab Spring of 2011 in Egypt, where, yes, you had an, an incredibly corrupt, corrupt Hosni Mubarak, who I think I've heard estimated stole $35 billion during the time of his dictatorship, even though he had somewhat of a working relationship with Israel. But the Muslim Brotherhood not only takes, you know, uses his corruption as an excuse to create an Islamist theocracy and one that's very much based on anti-Semitism. So Nasser is not Islamist, he's not a religious man, but he's full in on the terrorism and he's all in on this idea of anti-Semitism. And again, as you, if you, those of you who remember from the, the lecture last week, this kind of anti-Semitism, this kind of virulent genocidal anti-Semitism is not something that is really in, 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 root, in the roots of Islamic tradition. It, it just isn't. There's plenty of problems with Islamic tradition and teachings in the Quran and things like that, but nothing like genocide. That's a new thing that the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century started. And Mubarak does, becomes, becomes like a cafeteria Muslim. He likes the anti-Semitism. He doesn't like the Islamism. So one of the first things that he does in addition to setting up raids into Israel is he starts to put put the, put the cl clamping down on the Muslim Brotherhood, which sounds like a great thing. He's putting the, he put a lot of the Muslim Brotherhood guys in jail and he 
he, he does things which had to have been considered positive, at least in that sense, in, in Israel and, and for those people who, who knew what was going on at the time. The problem is he's still a big anti-Semite, and he feels that now that he's put the, the, the handcuffs on literally and figuratively on the Muslim Brotherhood, he's got to find a way to make sure that people who kind of liked some of their teaching don't get too upset. So he really makes it clear, hey, I really hate the Jews too. I also have a genocidal idea about the Jews, just like the Muslim Brotherhood does. I'm just not an Islamist and I don't like those guys and I want to be in power, not them. But don't worry, I'm going to make up for it with killing Jews in Israel, whether it's something that's going to undermine their military and make it easier for us to beat them in a war or not. Who cares? These raids are, 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 are wins in and of themselves. And especially since we got Palestinian, uh, do, Palestinians doing it more than Egyptians. So we're not even risking too many of our own people. That's the situation that, you, that you're dealing with in Israel for roughly three years leading up to 1956. So that's where Israel is. That's where Israel is as we get to 1956. It's an untenable situation because these raids are getting more and more brazen. He's creating a paramilitary force, the Fedayeen forces in Gaza, who are getting more and more experience, getting more and more trained on what they need to do. And at the same time, Nasser is making deals to really, really arm his country. He's arming his country now, and that is really, really problematic, as you might expect. In 1955, so he's barely in office for one year, Gamal Abdel Nasser makes a deal with Czechoslovakia. It's funny because so did, so did Israel. They made in 1948 deals with Czechoslovakia to get a few planes, as I talked about last time. This time, though, Czechoslovakia isn't making lousy weapons. It's, just a, it's really just a conduit for Soviet weapons. The Soviets used Czechoslovakia as a way to get around some international issues to heavily arm Egypt. And the official treaty is Egypt and Czechoslovakia, but of course it's the USSR deciding that now they're going to be all in with an anti-Israel policy. Now, you remember the Soviet Union voted in favor of the State of Israel in the 1947 partition plan vote in the UN. There are some really, really good books. I didn't include the, the link because this is an easy one to remember. But for a pretty good, and I think in a lot of ways, probably the best way to follow how that relationship between the Soviet Union and Israel started off on this kind of crazy footing and then went south really quickly, I highly re recommend the biography of Golda Meir, Lioness, because she was the first envoy of the State of Israel to the Soviet Union. And she, in some ways, although this is not a mistake on her part, and this is certainly not a stain on her reputation, but she, in a lot of ways, played a big role in the Soviet Union deciding to completely abandon any, any semblance of balance in the Middle East after something that happened with Golda Meir and her first really official visit to the Soviet Union, it's around the time of Rosh Hashanah. And Rabbi, if you're listening, this is a great little story to tell during one of your sermons during Rosh Hashanah, because it's really, really moving. Uh, Golda Meir is not a religious woman, but she understands she's an Israeli official. It's Rosh Hashanah. It's not, it doesn't look good for her not to try to go to Shul. So she finds out where the Grand Synagogue in Moscow is, and she decides to go, and she surprisingly shows up in Shul. And then, of course, she comes back for the second day. Between the first day and the second day, every Jew in Moscow understands what, what has happened and that she's there. And they line the streets 10, 11, 12 deep, tens and tens of thousands of Jews. They jam into the synagogue to try to be with her just to see her, to see someone from a Jewish state. And it's the most moving moment of her entire life. And it, really anyone who was there, it must have been moving for a number of reasons. One is to see the desperation of the people. But two, the Israeli government in 1948 and even a couple of years before had absolutely considered the Soviet, Soviet Jewry to be, a, to be a lost cause. By 1948, they felt that it had been too many years since the revolution, that there weren't enough Jews who really cared about being Jews anymore. There wasn't possibly a population in, in the Soviet Union that could really be relied upon or could be advocate, advocated for to, to become Im, you know, immigrants to the state of Israel. And of course, this disabused her and everyone else. Clearly, there was a clamoring to live as Jews and, and, and subsequently a clamoring to live in Israel. And when the Soviet government saw that, they freaked out to use a more modern term. They got afraid, they got worried, and they decided to look at the Jews as a fifth column, talking about <laughs> recurring themes in history. We're back to Pharaoh during the time of, you know, during the Passover story. They, they immediately started seeing the Jews as more of a fifth column. There was already anti-Semitic policies from Stalin before that, to be sure. 
But this is when things start getting really bad because they see a Jewish presence truly is in the Soviet Union and interest in Israel. And they start fearing that they'll be unloyal Soviet comrades, which rightfully so they should have been because it wasn't worth being loyal to the Soviet regime. But that's another story. So one of the things they do uh, is they start thinking about how they can arm the enemies of Israel. And at the time, Egypt is the most important enemy of Israel. And they get start getting arms from the Soviet Union via, via the Czechoslovakia conduit that I mentioned before. So now it's really scary. The Egyptians are using the Fedayeen forces, Nasser, to attack Israel all over the country all the time. They're getting more experienced and they're getting really well equipped. Uh, sorry, <laughs> equipped. So this is really a tough, tough situation. Now, Israel in that situation is thinking about who can they, who, to whom can they appeal? Who can they ask for help? The Soviet Union has long before 1956 cut off diplomatic relations with Israel in any formal way. So they can't say to the Soviet Union, hey, cut it out. Maybe we can cut a side deal. I don't know. You know, maybe we'll, but, but they can't do that. So, of course, naturally, the next person to go to, the next entity to go to is the United States. And President Eisenhower at the time is not really all that interested in getting involved in this. And there's a number of reasons why. And one of them is not that he was um, not that he was an anti-Semite. Uh, I highly recommend, and this is um, picture number two, uh, link number two, I think it is. Yeah, I uh, just want to make sure I have it right. I'm so sorry, I have my own list here. Yeah. Uh, well, here's another one. This is um, that. That's good. We can we can put picture number two, but actually, I should probably skip. I apologize for this. I have to have three different uh, screens going at the same time. Uh, let's go to picture number three, and then we'll go back to number two. Um, and picture number three is, is a link to uh, one of the many, many, many books that Stephen Ambrose wrote about Dwight David Eisenhower. Uh, I mentioned Eisenhower in the last lecture because Eisenhower was a good uh, role model for, for General Mickey Marcus and the way that General Mickey Marcus was really a hands-on guy, and Eisenhower was. And General Mickey Marcus also understood how to intervene between different factions in the general staff. Eisenhower was a really great peacemaker within the Allies during the war. Um, but, it, it, you know, one of the things about Stephen Ambers, maybe some of you might remember, towards the end of his life, he was hit with the plagiarism scandal. Uh, it was ridiculous. It was like two sentences in a book that were honestly you know, really, really nitpicking. Uh, unlike some of the other major plagiarism scandals that never went any anywhere else. Um, he wrote tons of books about Eisenhower. Stephen Ambrose was a young professor, like an assist assistant professor at, I think, the University of Kansas. And for some reason, Eisenhower had read a book that he had read, he wrote about a, a paper he had read about Didi, and he said, you're going to be my official bi biographer. So a few years before he died, Stephen Ambrose gets this big break and really gets access to a lot of Eisenhower's papers. Um, there are a lot of a lot of books. So if you if you only have time for one, this is the one to, to read Eisenhower, Soldier and President. It's all of the the professional life of, of, of Dwight David Eisenhower in the many books. That, and I, I recommend all of them. But this is a good one to read because it's a good way for the for the few pages that he de that he dedicates to the 1956 Suez crisis, as it was called in the Sinai campaign in Israel or Operation Kadesh, as it was called in Israel. Um, Eisenhower is really worried about. World War III starting over small conflicts. And he's also worried about people who are trying to make money and political gain out of small things that they think will never really get out of control because people are worried, people are worried about World War III. In other words, Eisenhower believes that there are some countries and some military types who figure we can get away with a small war that before the nuclear era we couldn't get away with because people are, will be worried about starting a nuclear war. So they'll just be happy with it ending. And, and we'll get away with it. And on the other hand, he's, he's worried about that not working out, that maybe it will lead to World War III. And Eisenhower is pushing back against some people in the State Department who really want, the, who not only don't want the United States helping Israel with arms and, and money, they want them to start sanctioning Israel. He's pushing back on those types. And Eisenhower, once again, is juggling things pretty well, in my opinion. Now, remember, this is 1956. The Suez War, as we talk about it, will actually begin just a few days before his re-election. He's re-elected in November of 1956, and the real fighting in the Sinai campaign starts on October 29th. Um, 
Eisenhower knows he's going to be reelected by a lot. It's not going to be much of a contest. He knows that by then, surely by October of that year, he knows it's not a contest. He know he doesn't. He know he's going to be president for another four years, and he'll be darned if something like this escalates into another Korean War or something worse. And he's pushing back against the jerks at the State Department who want Israel to be sanctioned by the United States, to be really punished and and some way uh, even more marginalized. So that's my way of saying Ike says no. Israel goes to him and says, you know, hey, we want, you know, we, we, we kind of want to be able to push back against these Egyptian incursions that are killing our civilians and 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 hurting our, our, our economy and all these things like that. And we want to be able to, A, have your blessing to attack them, and B, we want uh, some weapons. You know, we're not asking for the moon, but they, and, and Eisenhower says no. So along come the other guys. And now we can go back to picture number two. Sorry about that, link number two. And the other guys in this story are the British and the French. Now I thought I was being Mr. Genius when I was thinking about this lecture a few days ago and I was thinking, you know, one of the ways that you can really introduce the idea of the importance of the Suez War and in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Sinai campaign is to use that as an understanding that this was the end of the pre-Cold War idea in the world. This was the end of British colonialism. This was the end of French colonialism, which certainly really in many ways ended before, well before that, possibly, you know, pretty much in the year, pretty much with Indian independence and Pakistani independence and things like that. But there were people who still believed that this could, that there could be more than one, than two superpowers. There could be a lot of different players at, at the table. Once the Sinai campaign fleshes out, you know, shakes out like, like it did, that's the end of that. And so then I see that there was this guy named Keith Guile who wrote the book about how this really truly was the, the, the clear end of any notion of a non-Super Cold War, two superpowers, um, by, you know, bilateral world. Um, and, and that's really, you'll see why that happens. But the British and the French are still under the illusion that they can be big players in the world and they would like to have something carved out for themselves. And so why do they get involved? Because Nasser, un, um, um, among the other things that he does to, to consolidate his popularity and what makes him really popular is that he's very much, just like King Farouk was, but ineffectually so, and certainly without the char charisma of, of Nasser, Nasser wants to get rid of the British and the French colonialism in the Middle East, which makes him a hero not only in Egypt, but also in places like Syria where the French had more of a foothold than, than, uh, than the British. And so he's really big on nationalizing the Suez. Nationalizing is a fancy word that journalists use because they don't like to use, you know, write in a long sentence when, when they can use one word, but basically stealing it from the British. We're gonna make it owned by the Egyptians as opposed to owned and operated by the British. And Nasser wants that for Egypt. He believes it, it's, it's something that, you know, is literally physically on Egyptian territory and he doesn't want the British to be in charge of something that's in uh, on, on, on sovereign soil of Egypt, which is really, really popular. It sounds like something that will be economically good for, you know, things get nationalized all the time. And he also wants to prove that he's an Arab leader for a cultural Arab. Remember, Nasser's a cultural Arab. He's not an Islamist. He's not a religious guy. Um, for example, the person who succeeded him, Anwar Sadat, Actually, was quite. He wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't an Islamist by any stretch. But he was much more of a devout Muslim than, than Nasser ever was, which might be one of the reasons why he was more inclined to 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 be peaceful after trying to outdo Nasser in the Yom Kippur War, which we'll talk about you know, two lectures from now. But anyway, Nasser now has really angered the British and the French. The British and the French start to plan a an attack on Nasser. Now, they're not necessarily looking to overthrow him. They're looking to smack him in the face. They're figuring that this is a way that they can get this done, that this will work to get him to back off the, um, the, the threats to, um, to nationalize the Suez and to kick out more uh, British and French businesses from the general region. And so they're ready, they're ready to do this. They're ready to do this, but they realize they don't have to be the only ones to do it. And they start to encourage the Israelis in a way that the United States didn't. And then how do they encourage them? They encourage them by putting their money where their mouth is, they supply weapons. Now, this was not something like they sent Israel an email or a letter and said, hey, we got some weapons, come and get them. They just sort of sent out some signals. And the man who goes to Paris personally 
to find out what they're really offering and to secure a deal is a young man named Shimon Perez. And the first thing that he really does to become a player in major, in, in, in it, really a seat at the, at the before, before this time, Shimon Perez is kind of at the kids' table. He's sort of a, I would say, kind of like, you know, in today's terminology, he's kind of like a glorified intern and acolyte of Golda Meir. But he personally goes to, to France and Paris and negotiates a couple of weapons specifically. He gets, in a, again, what weapons do they get? And we'll talk about that in a second, because this is ultimately we're talking about military strategy here. But Shimon Peres um, goes to France and gets them to put their money where their mouth is. And he gets them to give them the weapons that he was looking for. Um, let's take a look at some of those weapons. We're going to go back to our list, which I have to just go to my, sorry about that. Let us go now to, yeah, hold on. Where do I have it? Yes, okay. This is now, yeah, let's take, so there's a couple of links here that are pretty, that are, that are fun. First is, this is first, uh, this is the first website, which just is a, like a glossary, but it's good just so you know what we're talking about here. This is a website that just lists as you scroll down with a small pictures of some of the weapons. So because I don't want to leave out any of the weapons, you can see these are all the weapons that were used and it has the flag of the country that used them or the flag of the country that made them. And all these were used by one side or the other in the war. And it's a long list. But if we go to the next one, you can start talking. Let's talk about specifically the two key French um, pieces of weaponry that the Israelis use. So let's go to number five here, because this is interesting, because this is something that Israel didn't have. Even in the War of Independence, Israel doesn't really have tanks. And now in the Sinai campaign, in the years leading up to the Sinai campaign, they get, not only do they get this tank, but they get an interesting tank. This is the AMX-13. And you can click and enlarge that if you click on the picture. Okay. This is like a, you know, this is what the AMX-13 looks like. And as you see, this is not, for 1956, this is a pretty modern looking tank. And it was, it was pretty new. The French didn't start making the AMX-13 until 1952. Different versions of this without really that much of a difference in it stayed in production, if you can believe this, until 1987. So for 35 years, this is the primary tank, give or take a couple of, of, of modernizations on the technology on the inside for the French military. And Israel gets quite a few of them from France. So they get that. And this to Israel is a new thing. They did not really have any real artillery. Some of you listening might know that Israel later on develops its own tank, the Merkava tank, which, which is Hebrew for chariot. <laughs> they love their biblical allusions to weapons. The ultimate weapon in the universe right now, which sounds like I'm talking about the Death Star from Star Wars, but it is the ultimate weapon in the universe right now is the F-35 stealth jet fighter. Yes, it's overpriced. Yes, it has a lot of other issues with it. The Israelis have made it a much better uh, weapon than, the, than Lockheed Martin ever did on its own. The Israelis have doubled its stealth capacity, maybe even tripled it by now. What the Israelis call their version of the F-35, the Adir. For those of you who stay up long enough to the end of the Seder, you know that we sing the song Adir Who, and it means awesome. It's awesome. So uh, they like their names. But getting back to this is the tank that the, the French supply the, the Israelis. And then they su supply them, let's go to number six, with three different jets, not just propeller fighter planes, like, propeller planes uh, like they had in the War of Independence, but these are actual jets. For those of you who understand, the difference between a jet and a prop plane isn't just that you get there faster, it is no contest. Jets against non-jets have no chance. <laughs> okay, the, the, the non-jets have no chance. In World War II, there was a famous battle where the, the Germans did have a prototype of a jet fighter. And like all stories of, mili of new military technology, they decide, well, we're not so sure this is really gonna work. Let's just use, just, just use a couple. This happened in World War II, World War I as well uh, with the first tank. They were like, well, they, well, we could have had 15 tanks, but let's just use one and see how it does. And 16 weeks of stalemate end on this one tank until it's finally disabled and, and the French realized they screwed up. They should have used 10 tanks. Same thing with the Germans. The Nazis in World War II towards the end of the war use a couple of jet fighters and they knock out like this whole squadron like that, a number of squadrons of, of prop planes. Um, so just to give you an idea, like this is 1956 and granted it's more than 10 years since the end of World War II, but aerial warfare has changed to the point now where it's all jets all the time, even though prop planes are still used for certain types of attacks, the jets really rule the skies. And the, and the French give 
the Israelis three kinds of jets. And my mother is a is fluent in French and it was a French teacher for many years. And so she made sure that I got my pronunciation right here. The Dassault, the Oregon, which sounds like the state of Oregon, and the Mystère. These are three different jets that the Israelis are supplied from, that get supplied from France. And that's what they have to work with. Now, they're still heavily, heavily outnumbered. The, the, the Soviets have been supplying the Egyptians with many, many more uh, types of, 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 of weapons for a long time, including MiGs, which was the, you know, the, the Russian jet fighter. And they still have more, but Israel for the first time has something that matches in effectiveness, if, if not in quantity. They still, in quality, they're matching what the Egyptians had. Now, if you remember from the lecture in the War of Independence, Israel didn't have the quantity or the quality of the, uh, of, of the weapons that their enemies had. In this case, it's pretty, it, I, I believe that their tanks were better, and certainly their jet fighters were just as good as what the Russians had supplied the Egyptians. So that's important. The Israelis understand that they have certain advantages. They have certain advantages that they didn't have before. So how does this come into play? Let's go to uh, number seven right now, because it comes into play first at a place called Rafa. And I'll just wait for the, the rabbi to put up the, the, uh, the map of Rafa that I have. Now, some of you may, are, may be familiar with the name Rafa because every time there's an uprising uh, in the Gaza Strip or rockets are fired into Israel now from Gaza, one of the things that Israel often does is it closes the Rafa Pass, which is a way to get to the Israel proper from, uh, from Gaza, and it's also connected to Egypt. And one of the main, main heroes who really plays an even bigger role in this war than he did in the Independence War is Moshe Dayan. And Moshe Dayan looks at this map and he's, and it's, you know, you didn't need to be Moshe Dayan and someone of his prowess to understand that cutting off Rafa is, and attacking there and, and getting control of the ground there is going to be a great way to keep the Egyptians from being able to get into the land of Israel to launch any kind of a counterattack. And for this attack, those AMX-13 tanks, so, so Moshe Dayan decides to attack Rafa in the idea of cutting off Egypt from really finding any way to launch a counterattack or to, to be ready when the Israelis do go into the Sinai, which happens a little, you know, just a couple of days later, he realizes the first thing he has to do is protect the home, the home, the homeland, the home, the, the home ground, his own end zone. And so he, he decides that, that demobilizing and blocking Rafa is the way to do that. And the AMX-13 tanks play a huge role in that successful campaign. That is exactly what happens. And so, as we get into late October, that's the first thing that happens. And of course, that's the first inkling that people like Eisenhower and the Soviets get that something's up. Because why is Moshe Dayan worried about an Egyptian counterattack? Because in those days where after Shimon Peres gets the weapons, the Israelis agree to a Br British and French plan called Operation Musketeer, easy to remember, where they are going to launch an attack on, on Nasser, to push any, push any of his forces away from the Suez. Again, they're not looking to overthrow him necessarily, although they wouldn't mind that happening as a result of this attack, but they're looking to really cut him off at the knees. And they figure the Israelis will play the role of attacking on the ground in the Sinai, and they will attack Suez proper. They will attack the Suez area and beyond. That'll be the British and the French's job. So at this point, they start to help a little bit. Not only do the AMX-13 tanks from, from France that the Israelis are using helped in the successful capturing and cutting off of Rafa, but the, there are British naval ships in the Mediterranean Sea just off of Rafa who are providing artillery cover. Now, as, as it turned out, that was more artillery cover, uh, ar ar artillery cover in theory than actual effectiveness because Moshe Dayan notices that the artillery is usually only attacks Egyptian reserves far away from Rafa. He's very unhappy with how effective that artillery fire is. But again, it may have been effective more mentally than physically on the ground because the Egyptians see that they're getting hit from more than one side. And it seemed to really, really cut any kind of, there just wasn't much of, a, of, a, of an impetus for the Egyptians to fight back very much after they are in, 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 surprised at Rafa. Now, what's the Israeli plan after that? The Israeli plan is to take control of the Sinai Peninsula as far as the land situation is, but they're going to stop 10 miles short of the Red Sea. 
they're going to stop short 10 miles short of the Suez because the British and the French have said, we'll do the Suez. And the Israelis don't want a friendly fire. They also don't want to steal the British and the French's thunder. And they also don't want to make it look like they're crossing from the Sinai into, which is really Egypt proper. They, they realize that this is really problematic for them. So that's the plan. The plan is to go as far as 10 miles from the Suez within and, and, and remain on the Sinai Peninsula. Now that they do, let's go to map number eight. That they do at a place called the Mitla Pass. And the Mitla Pass, if you scroll down, you'll see it. The Mitla Pass is pretty obvious why that is, now you're going too far. So go back up just a little bit. The Mitla Pass is, if you stop there, you'll see it here on this map. The Mitla Pass is this narrow area Almost the almost as far west as you can possibly get in the Sinai Peninsula, and it also has kind of an inlet of, of, of water there. It's really, really that's the strategic place to hit. Now the Israelis have the the tanks and they have the jets, and that's all well and good, but this is pretty far away. They can't just go with the tanks and and go all the way down down the Sinai Peninsula. They don't have that kind of the, that kind of wherewithal. So they use a different division of the Israeli defense forces at the time that were the, the, that become the most elite unit of the IDF for many years until the Israelis become fully equipped with a massive amount of jet fighters, which doesn't happen until really the late sixties and into the early seventies, the most elite force in the IDF are the paratroopers. And the paratroopers are, and they say in, they're called the San Hanim, they're the most elite unit. That's the, that's the toughest unit to get into if you're interested in a, in a military career. And they're mostly, they, they have different commanders, but their most famous individual commander is Colonel Ariel Sharon, who's one of many of the paratrooper commanders who's involved in what becomes known as Operation Kadesh in Israel, the Sinai campaign or the Suez crisis. That's really the, it, it, despite the fact that the Rafah incident happened that was on the Gaza Strip, that wasn't considered to be as provocative as what happens on October 29th, 1956, the Israelis led by a paratrooper group attack the Mitla Pass. And that's where they go with the paratrooper group. And it is an interestingly quick success. At one point, the Egyptian general in charge of the Egyptian forces there be believes this is just a raid from afar. In other words, he believes it's like an artillery attack. They're going to try to shoot, you know, almost like a shooting gallery, try to hit some of the Egyptian targets there and they'll, they'll see how that goes. It's not, it's, it's way too late before he realizes this is kind of an invasion. This is, they're dropping paratrooper forces and they're really looking to get rid of them, not just to punch them in the nose or something. And what happens is you get 180 Israelis who are killed in this raid, but there are a thousand Egyptians killed. And most importantly, 6,000 Egyptian POWs that are captured as a result of this paratrooper, paratrooper a paratrooper drop inside the Mitla Pass. And at the same time, the British and the French start working, inching their way towards the Suez. So October 29, 1956 is a really important day. This is when the world knows that, there's, that this is not just some small security operation by the Israelis. This is a major operation involving three different militaries from three different countries. And that is really the, the point of the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the Suez crisis or this, of this war. Now, let's get back to the politics. So the word gets out that there's something really going on here. So the two angriest people in the world are not, are not uh, uh, Egyptians. The two angriest people in the world now are Nikita Khrushchev and, and Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower is furious for a number of reasons. One is, like I said earlier, he doesn't want all these kinds of fights starting that could end up in World War III or end up encouraging other fights starting if they don't end up in World War III. And Khrushchev is angry because he believes that the Israelis are, and the British and the French are attacking him personally and, and, and the Soviet regime personally. And worst of all, the British and the French and the Israelis don't tell the United States that they're about to launch these attacks. So Ike is angry about the fact that it happens. He's furious that he's not informed about it beforehand. And he's not going to stand for it. And it's very, very clear at this point, it's not gonna be a situation like we have now in Ukraine where there was 
you know, there's going to be this sanction here and people are going to be upset. Eisenhower's like, we're ending this now. And we are going to not just get them to stop shooting. We're going to get the Israelis and the British and the French to move out, back off, which is, again, to put it in our context of today's news, that's a lot more than we're kind of doing right now. We're, we're talking that way. But I, Ike is saying, I'm, this is going to happen. And he uses all the influence that he can possibly use, which at the time is quite considerable, as you might imagine. Remember, Europe is still kind of rebuilding on the Marshall Plan. They really don't have much to, they don't have many other places to go to if they anger Ike. And just as Eisenhower predicts, it does encourage more of this kind of nonsense because on November 4th, 1956 is the date that the Soviets start their incursion into Hungary and to put down what they considered to be a political coup against the Iron, you know, the Iron Curtain uh, dummy government in Hungary. And the only reason why the Soviets do that is because there's such an outrage in the world about what's going on in the Suez that they realize they can sort of get away with this, and they do. And it kind of, and that catches Ike by surprise as well. So all of those things happen, and they conspire to create that reality. Um, but there's a couple of things that happen before all the shooting stops. One is, I mean, you men I, I mentioned earlier, Colonel Sharon. And Ariel Sharon does something. At, at this point, Ariel Sharon was known for a couple of in uh, individual acts of, of what I'll call daring do, as they say, kind of uh, pretty interesting um, things that he had done as, uh, as a military commander of small units. Uh, let's go to picture number, um, number 10. Ariel Sharon, before the Sinai campaign, was known for his group of nighttime fighters, commandos, whose basically all they used to do was stuff that would be in response to Fedayeen attacks. Remember in the, in the beginning of this lecture, I'm talking about how Nasser had created this group called the Fedayeen, which did these raids into Israel during the night and during the day. And Sharon is the head of the group that is basically the commandos who go and respond to these and also create some kind of a policy where they're going to try to hit them even before they attack. And he's famous for doing a number of things, that, some really successful raids against Fedayeen strongholds with a small group of fighters. Before that, he was known for um, sitting, he was, there was, during the War of Independence and the days after it, there was a particular Jordanian commander who was very, very problematic, who had killed a lot of Israelis and had been very, very successful as a sniper and also as a commander. And he, Sharon, who at the time wasn't even a colonel, he's probably only a captain, and he's sitting in on a meeting where they're complaining about him. And then they break for lunch. And then they have part two of the, of, of the, of the briefing. And Sharon said, and, and they're saying, well, what do you think about this guy? And Sharon says, oh, during the lunch break, I captured him. He's in, he's in the cell downstairs. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, that's what he's famous. So he's already kind of famous for what he does, with, at least within the IDF. But he's also famous among some civilians in Israel as well. And Sharon understands that after the landing of the Mitla Pass and that initial success of 1,000 Israeli Egyptian soldiers killed and 6,000 POWs, he still feels that there's more that needs to be done. And he goes even further, which is something that he did again during the Yom Kippur War. He goes even further than commanded and captures even more of the high ground uh, between the, the Sinai, it, 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 that western area of the Sinai, uh, even further west than the Mitla Pass. So it really starts to establish Israel, despite the political disaster in many ways that the Sinai campaign was, it's important to understand that that actually was quite a military success because Israel up to this point had only felt like they could beat back the Arabs when they were about to take over their homeland, literally their own homes and their children and everything else like that. For the first time now, because of the Sinai, the success of the two major parts of the Sinai campaign, the, the parachute, the, the paratrooper drop of the Mitla Pass and the, and the taking of Rafa, they begin to understand that they can be successful when they do offensive attacks. And so that to me, I think, is probably the best thing that happens. So the, I'm going to give my little report card now, the wrap up of what happens. Now, not to leave you hanging on what happened, Eisenhower is successful in getting everyone to stop shooting. He gets the British and the French to run away with their tails between their legs. They never attack the Suez. They never do as promised. Like, remember I said the Israelis stopped 10 miles short of the Suez. The British and the French never, never, never do that. They run away, basically, because they realize that the, the United States is going to come down hard on them if they don't. And the Israelis also eventually move back. 
Now they get a few things out of it. In addition to what I'll talk about a little bit more as well, this military shot in the arm, and they realize that they can launch an, a larger scale offensive and be successful. They also get the Straits of Tehran, which is uh, the, the main port in the south of Israel, you know, where, where Eilat is. They get that reopened because the because uh, Nasser had closed that, and so that was an economic disaster for Israel. And the, Fre the, the, the connection with the French and weapons does not end in 1956. Despite the fact that there was never that attack on the Suez, the French continue to supply the Israelis with weapons for quite a few more years after that. And if you ever take a look, if, you're, if, you're, if you ever see newspapers or even newspaper editorial cartoons from Israel during that period of the late 50s going into the early 60s, it really starts, uh, Israel went through that period of being very, very um, connected to the French, not only for these political and military reasons, but culturally. In fact, there were some parts of Israel where they start putting up signs in French in addition to English and Arabic and Hebrew. Uh, now they might need to do that again because it's been a huge influx, as many of you know, of French uh, immigrants to Israel because uh, of, of the anti-Semitism there and other issues. Um, but there's that period of, I'd say, about seven, eight years where French-Israeli relations are really, really strong. And of course, that had a lot to do also with France's war in Algeria, as Algeria, um, the, their war with the, with, with the Arabs in, in Algeria expanded. They became friends with the Israelis as well, which is another reason why they supplied them with weapons. So those are some of the, the good things. I wish there were more good things that you could say came out of that war, but uh, not enough. Uh, so let me talk about some of the things that we learned from that war. First, as I said, it's the end of any idea that we're not in a bipolar Cold War type situation. It's really, really good for the for the Soviets. Now, the Soviets could you could say, well, you know, they the Soviets supplied the Egyptians with weapons, and they kind of got their butts kicked at the Mitla Pass and Rafah. Isn't that a bad thing? That's only if you think that the Russians and the Soviets at the time really cared about Egyptian lives. The Soviets, and up until this day, this is something that has survived Soviet stuff uh, in, into the modern day now with uh, with Putin. They like to do a lot of things that just cause mischief. And they prove that they could cause mischief. They like destabilizing actions. It's something that has been something that they've done. It's been part of their foreign policy, their military policy since the time of the USSR. It's also a good Yiddish term for this. They like to dance at all chasanas. You know, they, they like to be involved in all the little things they can possibly be involved in with the least amount of actual investment. And so even though the Egyptian forces that they supplied didn't really perform that great. They don't care, that's not the point. The point is they got some chaos there. They got cover for their, for their incursion into Hungary just a few days later. And it's clear now that the British and the French are under the complete auspices of the United States. They won't try to, they, in other words, they won't have to focus on a lot of enemies at once. They can focus on the United States only and they'll be in good shape there. Um, another bad thing is that it now really confirms Nasser as a hero for Arab, anti-Israel, anti-Semitic type policies throughout the Middle East. Yes, he doesn't really win anything, but the fact that the British and the French and the Israelis move off, it moves, is, 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 is excuse enough for him politically to say, hey, we won, we scared them away, which isn't true. But as you know, they did walk away. That part was true. And so that really helps him, it really boosts him. It's possible, remember, this is only two years after he becomes really the leader. It's possible somebody else within that original junta could have taken over. It's possible there could have been other things that happened that would have, of a more positive nature. This keeps Nasser in power until his death 14 years later. He dies of a, a brain tumor in 1970. Probably, who knows if he survives that long as a leader if it hadn't been from this, for, the, for the Sinai campaign and how it shook out. So very negative, very negative result there. It also woke the Arabs up to something else. The Arabs, one of the things that they, they mentioned during their protest of what Britain and France was doing, and also what Israel was doing by proxy, is they start to threaten Britain and France with withholding oil and withholding it through the Suez. And it really, really confirms to all the Arab leaders that they can use oil as a weapon, which they start to do a little bit later. They actually don't really start putting it into action until the late 60s and early 70s. But it confirms to them that oil is something that the West is willing to make a lot of concessions for and look the other way. So that's really a tough situation. And it also really hurt US-Israel relations. Many of you know, the US doesn't really start arming Israel until after the Six Day War. It's possible it could have come sooner if, that, if the Sinai campaign hadn't happened. 
And it certainly gave a tremendous new footing for the people in the State Department who were much more anti-Israel, who, who, who were able to point to this and say, you see, we told you this was a troublemaking place. We're lucky we got away with it this time. But we really need to do more than just turn our backs on Israel as far as not supplying them. We also need to be more punitive against them. Now, again, they don't really win that part of the argument, but they get a louder uh, voice and a louder platform. And it's a big reason why the Israelis are still relying on a lot of French and other types of weapons in the 1967 war, 11 years later, that much long longer. So it's more uh, of what the point I made last time about how, again, if you hear someone saying the United States has always been the using Israel as this puppet, it's not true. You know, the United States doesn't really give Israel military strength uh, or, or give them an opportunity for military strength until much later. And this probably kept that from happening for a long, longer time. So that's really where you are as this war ends in, uh, towards the end of 1956 uh, with, again, mostly I would say negatives, but some important positives that can't, can't be looked away, at, you know, ignored, not the least of which is that for the first time, Israel realizes that a large scale offensive campaign against their most formidable Arab uh, enemy and army can be successful. And of course, that really plays a huge role in their doctrine that leads up to the way that they're, you know, this is a great way for us to end it and have a cliffhanger for next week. This is really what leads up to a whole new Israeli military doctrine, which of course played a huge role, preemptive strike type role for 1967. Is there any anybody have any questions for Jake? Jake, that was really good. Definitely uh, very interesting. Um, I have two quick questions. Can you just talk a little bit about Arab nationalism, um, yeah. you know, particularly under Nasser? And do you feel that th this was a practice run for the invasion of uh, the Sinai during the Six Day War? Um. You know, Arab nationalism is is really an interesting thing. There's some, there's a couple of things that just don't fit uh, in the history of the world. <laughs> um, one is uh, this idea that you can create a pan-Arab uh, world where it's it's really under the auspices of kind of one type of government. You know, it's it's kind of like I went to a, I went to a high school. I went to Yeshiva of Flatbush. And the, when I went to Yeshiva Flatbush in the, in the 1980s, it was really funny. It was, it was actually more diverse than any other school I went to afterwards, even though we were all Jewish, because there were probably 20 different countries of origins if you counted everyone's parents and gra parents, forget, forget grandparents. And the idea that there was only one, you know, we had to have an Ashkenazic and a Sephardic Beit Midrash. We had to do all kinds of things. And I'm, and I'll, I'm, I'm forever grateful for it because the, the stereotypical American Jewish image was forever destroyed in my head at, from that day forward. And um, I'm quite, uh, again, grateful for it. Similar with the Arab countries. The, because Nasser becomes so personally popular, it starts to fuel this crazy idea that there can be one Arab government for all the Middle East. And of course, it leads to kind of a, a country for a while. They, they, for, for At least on paper for a while, Syria and Egypt become one country, the UAR, the United Arab Republic under pretty much the auspices of Nasser. Um, didn't work, not for, for many reasons, not the least of which they don't have a contiguous border. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's kind of hard to have two countries, but it was just, but the idea was that Arab nationalism really um, was very much, it, they, they tried, I mean, they, some of these movements were really based on this idea of a unified Arab na nationalism when the tribal nature of the Arab culture uh, was much more prevalent. So what you see now in the Gulf states makes, makes much more sense for the thousands, of, you know, for more than a thousand years of Arab history. It makes much more sense. The idea that you have individual emirs and tribal leaders, and that might seem really um, primitive to us, but the idea that one Egyptian leader, a secular one for that matter, would be some, you know, would work. It's very, it's quite advantageous that that's a policy that the Soviets pushed because it was a real square peg in a round hole. Um, and as, again, as, as personally successful as this made Nasser, it, it did lead to this crazy illusion that they could all join under some kind of one Arab, relatively secular thing. And it doesn't work. And it doesn't work in the other way either. It, 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 massive Islamism, which took hold and seemed to have a better chance of working, also didn't work because there's different kinds of, just like there are different kinds of Jews, there's different kinds of Muslims and the different kinds of Arab Muslims and it just doesn't work. And there are Christian Arabs and there are 
there are Arabs who are Druze. You know, I mean, it's just it's it, it's it's a silly idea. The idea is that you know, individual and more de and less decentralized works for peace. It works economically. There's a lot of good things about it, and uh, this was but this was one of the things that led them down that path. So it actually, was actually in some ways you could say it was a good thing because it led the Arabs to believe in this myth. And it kept them from from and and, and it wasted their time, um, in, in many ways. So it's kind of like that had a lot to do with it. But the Soviets played a huge role in this. They they were hoping that there would be some kind of secular Arabism that would embrace communism, and I mean that doesn't work on either scale. You have an Arab culture that's based on mercantilism and economics, even in some ways even more than the Jews, and you have a religious Muslim tradition. So communist. Communist Arab, you know, communist, uh, the communist idea uh, of both anti-capitalism and anti-religious makes no sense for Jews. It makes no sense for Arabs. They tried it with both of us. I mean, you know, we many of you know the the, the sad history of trying to push Jews into a communist. You know, and they 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 started collective farms, not only here, but there was a was there was like a whole gr a movement to resettle Jews from Europe into the United States and have them working on farms and stuff. Almost everyone I know who did that ended up becoming peddlers anyway. You know, they ran the farm, but they were selling furniture at the, at the, far, at the farm, you know, on the porch. It's just not who we are and it's not who the Arabs are. And pan-Arab nationalism, especially of a secular nature, uh, never worked. And uh, it didn't work here, uh, but it, it got a shot in the arm here, at least from a, they, it got a misleading shot in the arm. And what was your second question? I feel like because of the, the Suez crisis, Israel knew what to do. Oh. To Sinai. Yeah. You know, those of you who know the story of Eli Cohen, Eli Cohen, for the Syria part of the Six Day War, provided the locations of all those underground bases and, and things like that. Um, this absolutely helped Israel understand the topography of the Sinai much better. But most importantly, there was one specific part of it. There was a plan in the, in the Sinai campaign to attack what was the existing Egyptian Air Force while it was still on the tarmac. And that didn't really happen in, a, in large scale in the Sinai campaign, but it certainly, that was really the, that, that happened on the first night of the Six Day War, almost the entire Egyptian Air Force was knocked out on the tarmac. Um, now at the time of the Sinai campaign, these Egyptian Air Force bases were in, a, in the city of Luxor, you know, the ancient city of Luxor, L-U-X-O-R. It was, I think, in a different location in the Six Day War, but similar setup. So you're absolutely right. Like they, they, they pretty much took a look at those plans from 56, they updated them extensively, but the, the doctrine was the same. Let's hit them on the ground before they can take off. That's our best chance. And that was the idea uh, in, in, in 1956 as well, even though it wasn't carried out as much as it was in 67. Anybody else have any questions? Rabbi, I can't see if there's any hands up. Any questions? I'm looking Rabbi? around, but again, I, I feel like when we're done, I know everything. And I, I have to say that for uh, 52 years, I just uh, fake it like I know what I'm talking about. I'm like, oh, yeah, like the Suez crisis. But I have no idea. I know nothing until tonight. So thank you. Oh, and I don't only offer um, read, uh, reading material. Uh, for those of you who are fans of The Crown, or if you haven't watched The Crown on Netflix, the episode surrounding the Suez crisis was one of the, the best ones. In my opinion, the best one was the Billy Graham, Edward VIII one, um, which is from the second season. I think they're both in the second season. Uh, I, I highly recommend the, the first, at least the first two seasons of The Crown, but the episode where they deal with the, the Suez crisis literally begins with the Israeli tanks running into Rafa. That's how, that's how that episode starts. You don't even know, like, you're watching The Crown and you see these tanks moving in in the desert. And you're like, what the heck is this? But it is the right episode. You're watching the right one. And it's very well done. They did a really good job with that series when they dealt with historical stuff as opposed to some of the tabloid stuff, which they did well as well. Also, I don't think that is, that's as much uh, worth your time, although it's, it is very good. But the, the historical stuff they do is very, very good. And the Suez Crisis episode of The Crown, which must have been the second season, I highly recommend. Maybe, maybe even the first season, but it's in, it's in one or two. Just skip all the Diana episodes. Those were kind of boring. Yeah. Not as good. Jake, I appreciate everything. Again, it's excellent. I think we could all say we really picked up a lot of stuff. I hope you have power tonight because it looks pretty bad outside. Yeah, we're good. Uh, <laughs> and um, again, I'm really looking forward to the Six Day War. But we have a little spoiler. Yes, we knocked out all their airplanes. 
Yeah. Uh, but I never knew we were still using French aircraft. I thought by by the the si um, six day war we had American aircraft. So learned something yeah. new there. Um, so again, thank you very much for your time. We look forward to seeing you next Monday. Same and time, same place. Uh, again, thank you very much. And I got to figure out who's your famous father. Oh, um, my father is David Novak. Um, who for many years was a conservative rabbi. Um, he was the co-founder of the Union for Traditional Judaism, but he left the rabbi business in 1989. And he was always an academic as well, but he became a full-time academic. And um, this, this sadly will be his last year as full-time. He's been a, a professor at the University of Toronto for 26 years. Before that, he was at UVA uh, in Virginia. Um, he didn't want his last year to be a COVID uh, Zoom semester. So this will be his last uh, year there. Uh, well, December, he'll, he'll finish up. But he'll still write books and, and, and make appearances and things like that. Um, he's one of the old guard, you know, he's one, he, was like the, one, he was like one of the last pupils of uh, Saul Lieberman and, uh, and uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel and those, those glory day guys, uh, stuff like that. But he, he was smart. He also got his PhD in philosophy at Georgetown after he got his rabbinical degree. So it created a, an academic career for him as well. So, um, you know, you can, you can read up on him. He's, uh, he's, he's passe in the conservative movement, but, uh, but uh, he, he's, he's around. All right, thanks again, really appreciate it. Uh, I really appreciate all the time you're giving us as well. So thank you again. Look forward to seeing you on Monday. Uh, take care. I will. Thank you, this is great.